Well, thank you very much. So uh, I'm, I've been uh, at CSE for about six years now, and before that I was with the military. I have, uh, I've done a number of security jobs in the, in the military, mostly boots on the ground type jobs as opposed to uh, um, your world. I was uh, not really associated to IT except one time when I was tasked as an ISSO within an organization and I really didn't uh, have much training. And I don't know how many of you have experienced ISSOs before that aren't, yeah, that typically they're pulled from some other domain and then all of a sudden they're introduced to IT. And uh, it was an interesting experience for me and that was towards the latter end of my career. And then I started getting into information operations and such. So my background is quite diverse in the security space. I'm actually a learning and uh, development guy uh, for a long time now, and my studies are particularly around human systems integration, that kind of thing. So if you're wondering why I'm here instead of an IT guy, that's why. Uh, I'm not an IT guy. Um, so I, I, my interface with uh, technology stops at the monitor. Okay, I, I can turn it on and turn it off as the help desk tells me every time I screw up something. So. Anyway, so uh, I just want to get a feel for the room. How many are, are, are with small small agencies and small organizations, say less than 100, okay? Medium, like 100 to 500, and large. So most of you are from large organizations. So this is gonna be interesting uh, discussion because this matters, the size of your organization matters, right? Size matters, uh, a little bit. But when we're going through this, you'll see why we don't, we don't need to be wrapped around the size of our organization, but it does matter how you interface within your organization. How many are in the client-facing sort of uh, part of their organization? All right, okay, so everybody, most of the others are in the back end, uh, infrastructure, that kind of thing, okay, good. So this, this will matter to everybody that's in the, in the audience and we'll, and we'll go through why in a few minutes here. So here's the first thing. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about this because it's been phenomenal, the amount of times I've heard about people humans, uh, different types of leaders, different types of activities that are going on within an organization. Resistance, motivation, fear, confidence, risk. All these things are sort of human-related conceptions, human-related issues. And uh, there's been a number of, uh, of speakers so far in the, in the, in the uh, conference that have actually fed into this quite well. So security is definitely more than an IT problem, okay? And uh, I like the second one, varying levels of insecurity. Okay, we know that already that this uh, security in our business is a risk managed issue, right? We don't have 100% security anywhere. But the other thing about this, particularly given the author, uh, I think that the understanding that security is a human conception matters a lot throughout my conversation here. And we'll talk about that uh, as we get in a little bit more detail. <clears throat> So here are the objectives, and kind of contrary to most of the discussion in here, I'm not going to talk about adversarial actors, I'm going to talk about non-adversarial actors within your security domain, okay? And the other thing I'm going to talk about is basically uh, opportunities and interventions with human systems. This is not necessarily about security awareness, this is about a lot of other things that are piling into that. And why that matters to me is because, again, it's about human systems integration, human performance in the roles of security and in other roles within the organization that supports security. So we're gonna, I'm gonna talk a bit about the problem and, uh, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about a process, a recommended approach. And then if we get some time, we'll do the case studies, but uh, they're not really critical, but it's just to sort of drive home some of the points about looking beyond uh, the technical solution, so. Pretty interesting statement here. Most organizations, uh, we've already identified clearly within the conference so far that there's nobody that has a perfect setup, nobody has the dream world, nobody has an organizational setup that is perfect for security. This is just another uh, pile on that idea and that concept. So let's talk about a bit, bit about the problem. Let's talk about a bit, bit about the problem. There we go. So lots of other people have had stats, so I'm gonna throw in my stats here too. Uh, the degree to which these are actually accurate depending on the context is a, is a different, is, is 
potentially debatable. Uh, but in the incident world, 95% of all incidents investigated recognize as human error as a contributing factor. How many would agree with that statement? Why do you have any, does anybody have any sort of contrarian view of that? Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. It's all part of one big picture, right? So that's exactly it. So even if you go back to the very conception of what you want in your security architecture, if you miss something, that is human error. So when you get in there and you start rooting around in that, until AI and ML starts getting, solving a lot of our other problems, you're still going to see this. And we're going to see human interaction within the security world for uh, decades to come yet. And even then, we don't know what the influence is going to be, right? And in the uh, other space about vulnerabilities, this is sort of in the preventative side of things. 76% of identified vulnerabilities throughout systems and enterprise were more than two years old, and almost 9% were over 10 years old. This one's a little dated, it's 2014, the other one was 2015, but they're, they're both relatively reliable, and guess what, they don't change a lot over time, which talks to me about a systemic issue within the security community writ large, and within the business community. Okay. So, my premise here, or my whole proposal here, is about it's not just a technical problem. Okay? There's a requirement to integrate the technical with the human systems. And we often, uh, and I've seen it, I've been seeing it firsthand for decades actually, where there's a focus on the development of uh, certain pathway workflows to around a specific technical piece of equipment or piece of IT. And then what we end up doing is we kind of ignore everything else beyond that initial technical interface. Uh, human factors engineering, for instance, is, is, is primarily driven towards the physiological, physical, uh, and sometimes the psychological uh, attention of the people who directly operate whatever piece of equipment or whatever piece of kit is involved. It rarely extends beyond one layer, and so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more here. <clears throat> So, this is what I'm promoting. Systems integrated view. Everybody understands systems. Everybody understands systems of systems, and lots of people here have heard of systems approach, right? This is what we're trying to talk about here, just sort of to move our, our, our thinking about the problem space beyond the technical capacity to technical capability. And you'll see that, and you know it. You're already aware of this. We've heard a lot of discussion about it, and people have talked about it, so they know. And uh, it's really, it was really sort of refreshing to hear that and hear some of the speakers talk about the challenges. This is a significant challenge in our community, right? We need to find ways to respond to it. Just to put another uh, bent on it, there's no way of say, pulling off the human in the loop here. The human is almost continuously in the loop in some capacity within any kind of organizational security. So. The human dimensions of security, which is where we're starting from with this, is still talking about the problem space. First, there's an individual and a collective. The focus within the security community that I'm aware of basically seems to be focused on the individual. It doesn't really attend to the collective very much, okay, which is the first issue that we need to challenge. Then there's the various dimensions within that space. The phys physical, physiological, like I said, in some cases, particularly in the development of equipment for, uh, uh, in a new, in a new uh, stream of, of product service delivery, you may have some really good identify, uh, identification of human factors that are related to that. You'll talk about the technical interactions, the buttonology, so to speak, the ergonomics around the piece of equipment or piece of kit, the physical health and safety associated with that piece of kit. That's fine, and that's all great stuff. There's certainly stuff that's missing in here because we know within the IT world, the physio physiological and ergonomic functions of the individual pertaining to the IT haven't really been all that relevant, right? So, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's user interfaces, it's a lot of other things too, right? But the user interface, when they talk about HFE or human factors engineering, they're primarily concerned with the buttonology. How is it working? What's, you know, what's the visual acuity of the, of the people and how does that fit on the screen, et cetera. But a lot of the motivations, intents, in, intentions, and things like that aren't often considered. They, they are in some cases, but aren't often considered in the human factors. 
That's where we get into the psycho, psychocognitive aspects. Most of everybody in the room has been associated with training in some way, shape, or form, right, and learning. This is where a lot of this comes in, but there are a lot of other, uh, a lot of other uh, potential uh, connectors to the psychocognitive of, uh, aspects of, of security. Um, certainly there's knowledge, there's skills and abilities, there's certainly attitudes and motivations, and then there's the psychological health and safety, absolutely. Within here, however, when we're talking about security is when, and particularly, and we had this discussion with the, with the, with the, the discussion yesterday about the uh, phishing exercises, right? We've had talked about the, the user as an example. Most users know they shouldn't do stuff, but yet they still do stuff. Most executives know they shouldn't do certain stuff or they need to do stuff, but they don't do stuff. So there's things that get in the way there. Now what are those things and how do we reconcile those? And that's, that's what we're gonna talk about, uh, not just for users, but across the spectrum of people in, that are within an organization. This is another place where there's been actually very little study and very little understanding within the security community and the IT security community uh, is the, about the collective, the social, cultural aspects of what we do and how we, how we influence social cultural norms within an organization to adapt better uh, and adopt better security practices. Everybody talks about a security culture, no one knows how to bring one together, right? So this is about it, formal, informal relationships, structures, values, interests, policies, human practice, processes and practices, organizational group health and safety. These all matter, right? If you want, if you want your organization to shift even a little bit, they matter. And, and if you're looking at uh, change strategies, any kind of change management, change strategies, they're looking at these things and they're saying, how are we gonna move the organization or the group or the team or the individual a little bit to the right so that we understand that, that they're improving and they're, they're, they're meeting cultural norms or meeting the, the type of performance and behavior that we want demonstrated in our organization. <clears throat> now, so this is sort of, uh, taken from a uh, human performance technology model that basically says, you know, there's more views here. And this is, this is kind of important when you're looking at the context in which the worker is required to do stuff, okay? The context in which the manager is required to make decisions. The context in which the executive is expected to lead an organization. All the dark lines are about what normally gets concrete or it's explicit within the organization. Then there's the underlying in the blue that becomes a little bit more tacit. It's implicit sometimes within the organization. We don't often unbury those. These are often buried within the organization. We need to find these at least and talk about them. Very difficult sometimes, okay? And I know this is a challenge. I've been doing this for 20 years now. <laughs> and I know it's a challenge, but we need to we need to start thinking about this within the security community because some of the things we're talking about here are at the core of what somebody does in an organization and why they're doing it. Any questions about this here, about this structure? Basically, the worker is nested in a work group or a team and that is nested in the work and then there's the workplace in the world. And they're all influencing down and the worker is also influencing up, okay? So it's all nested. It's human complexity, and uh, we need to appreciate that. We may not be able to do everything we want about do about it, but we need to appreciate that what we're dealing with is complexity. So, generating co questions about human performance, uh, and whether individual or collective, there's lots of different influences, and there's management, methods, motives, et cetera. Somebody, anybody seen an Ishikawa diagram before? fishbone diagram for identifying effect, cause and effect. Has anybody seen this type of thing before? If you have, great. Then it's a phenomenal tool when you're sitting down either by yourself trying to figure out a situation or ideally with a bunch of other stakeholders who share different perspectives so that you can actually tackle some of the challenges that are in here. It's just to, to, to help brainstorm some of the potential issues that could be related to individual and collective performance. Uh, one thing I want to note here is as we're discussing this, how many, uh, what do you note from this other than the fact that they all begin with M? 
Ah, oh, <laughs> that's your number. <laughs> yeah. Is there any sort of, you're in an organization now, what do you see there relate, relative to the organization? So, guess what? We all have, uh, is there a little, we all have people in our organization that are experts at handling the money. Well, they may not be experts. They are the people who handle the money. We have people who deal with logistical issues within our organization. We have a, e people who deal with the processes and policies within our organization. We have people who deal with the manpower or woman power in our organization. There's people who schedule time and manage the time within the organization. There's people who acquire and run the machines. There's people who take measures. There's people who are responsible for leading and, and, and guiding individuals. And there's people who work on constructing teams and effective work uh, groups. So guess what? You're not in this alone. When you're trying to identify the individual and collective performance issues within the security team or within the organization, you know what? Drag some of these other people in there with you. Leverage the expertise and the experience within your organizations to help you come to grips with the extent of the problem. Because I can tell you right now, one person cannot provide the whole world view of the organization. Doesn't matter how long you've been there, how much experience you have, you've tended to work in a relatively a uh, stable domain of work, and you may not be connecting with a lot of other parts of the domain. So this will help you a lot, to, and it builds relationships, but it helps you create a better, richer picture of what the organization actually, uh, the organizational challenges are. So here's the tension that we're trying to resolve. We know this exists. What somebody uh, talked about, this, this was the gap between security and and the business community and all this, uh, the work demands, local culture and budget. You know, last, I think it was uh, a few weeks ago, I heard it termed as a gap of grief for the security people, and I get that. And, the, and, and it is, it is, a, it is a hard road to hoe, and we've heard many stories today, including Paul just recently was talking about the struggle in getting executives to understand. Well, that's because they're working primarily over here. They don't understand this. So you need, we need to make it easier for them to understand that, so, and we need to do it in their terms, because it's their business, it's not ours. Ours is security. Right? So we can, there's ways of bridging this gap and alleviating some of the tensions between the security and the work uh, culture. And that largely means that if we really want to be effective here, we're going to have to do a good job of getting into this space here. So going back to the fishbone diagram, it allows you to explore different aspects of the business so you're able to talk to those ends. So overall, a different approach is required, I think. And uh, <clears throat> we've been struggling at this within the, uh, the security training and education space for quite some time. Uh, we've been focusing our attentions on security people. Uh, and then there's a security awareness layer over top the degree to which the effectiveness of the security awareness programs are working and identifying uh, individual roles and responsibilities in an organization for security are uh, mixed, to say the least. So I, in here, we're talking about complexity, okay? You've got the technology that you guys are very familiar with, then you understand the dynamic threat. Uh, the threat is, is unpredictable, we never, we can, kind of have, uh, we can take some time to think about what the threat's potentially going to do to us. We understand the threat actor capabilities. We understand the probability of them potentially wanting something that we have, okay? So we understand that. We understand the technology. And then we insert people. And now, regardless of how well structured you were here or here, You've immediately increased your complexity within your, in your organization. Uh, I'm not going to put a number to it, but a lot, okay? So you're going to have irreducibility. It means you can't reduce it down to a single thing. Uncertainty. We're always going to be living in uncertainty when you have people associ associated to the productivity of your organization. Unpredictability. As much as we say we can predict things within the security, the minute you put people in there, it doesn't matter, you have an element of unpredictability. Emergence, a lot of the stuff that happens within, within our world, okay? Um, particularly in our, in our world because it's so dynamic. It is moving all the time. 
there's a lot of things we don't know, and then all of a sudden we encounter something, and now we know something we didn't know before. And we couldn't have predicted that we know that. So lots of stuff is emerging. We have a lot of simultaneity going on, and that things are being happening all at the same time, and they're influencing things up, but we don't know what the outcomes will be. And of course, it's multi-layered. So complexity. So thinking in complexity is a, is a huge issue here, and, and how do we do this? We don't just throw up our hands and say, well, obviously, it's the problem's unsolvable, so why do we bother? Well, you guys are all in the room for a reason, and that's why we bother. <laughs> you know, we want to do better. We want to get things going. We want our secu the security of our organizations to become better. So let's talk a little bit about the process. Again, this is just a suggested process. There's lots of, uh, buried underneath these process, large process steps, there's, there's entire PhD books, uh, master's thesis, et cetera, associated with these. So the idea, though, is to sort of simplify it a little bit, uh, bring it up a notch, and say, okay, this is, this is what I recommend you do in trying to che check, uh, some of the uh, check the balance of the, security, the complexity a little bit when you're dealing in uh, security issues and trying to change the security uh, posture within your organization, given the fact that all these human systems are interrelated with the cyber systems. So, first thing is defining the problem correctly. I'll submit to you, and I've seen it again. This is not coming uh, because I've, this has been something I've experienced. The first thing I see is solutions thinking. I want a solution now, put it in place now, and yeah, I'm not gonna, we're not going to spend our time mulling over this. We've also heard the word in, uh, paralysis of by analysis, and that's not what I'm advocating either, but I am advocating the actually clearly define the problem first. Those of us who are engineers who have worked with IT systems understand problem defini definition phase and definition phase within requirements. That's all we're looking at here. Is it a perception of a security problem? Is there data suggesting that there may be a security problem? Or do we actually have evidence of a security problem, right? These are very, three di very different issues that require different approaches. Just because somebody reads a bur article and then all of a sudden gets scared because they're hearing about all these threats from various different uh, actors within the, within the world, and then they get to their office building the next day and all of a sudden they're saying, okay, now I understand the threat, so let's go quick, let's do something about it. Well, is that a perception of a threat or is that actual understanding of what the security problem is? <clears throat> so when you're garnering the opinions about this and trying to come up with the problem definition and stuff, we all have biases, we all have presuppositions before we go into solving any problem. Biggest thing is how do you check these? How do you keep them, keep them at the door when you're talking about it? Critical thinking, systems thinking, two very good tools that you can pull out of your toolbox. And I, got, and I have to tell you, you have to do this consciously. Very difficult, right? I've been caught numerous times with my assumptions down, right? And I need to be, you need to be careful in this space because you gotta make sure you're checking your facts. And because you're working with people and you're working with an organization, things may not be factual. They may, may, may not be evident in the data. So you may need to find a collective perspective, a shared understanding and shared meaning within, with any group you work with, okay? Understanding systems thinking is that when we put a piece in, a good example is putting an inline defensive mechanism into your system. Do I understand everything that's associated with that? Have I understood that the resources required for that? Do I understand the management around that? Do I understand the implications of that to the organizational operation or the system operation? Okay. So here's the process, the suggested approach. Uh, iterative, uh, so I heard about at least seven times yesterday about iteration, iterative, incremental approaches. We can't swallow the elephant whole, okay? Three main points, context analysis, gap analysis, options analysis. And I know the word analysis may drive some people buggy, okay? I, I understand that, but the context analysis here is really, really important. 
And this is about you getting to know your organization and the people you're deciding, you're creating the organizational or trying to tackle the problem with so that you all have a, a relatively common understanding. Everybody in your organization holds a different perspective, right? And you need to get the implicit stuff out. Cultural norms is an example, okay? But that context analysis is really important. The gap analysis, basically desired versus current state and any key gaps. Options analysis, suitable options based on well-balanced criteria. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So stakeholder interests, when you're doing your context analysis, as I said earlier, you know, you have a bunch of experts, you have a bunch of people who are concerned with the operation of the organization as well. Invite some other people to the room. Invite some other people to the table so that you can talk to them, right? They all have different interests, they all have different perspectives, and they might, like, more than likely will have different goals that sit below the organizational mission. You need to understand those. What are some other things that aren't actually up here about those, about those stakeholders? What other things might be of concern? Yeah, their own jobs. What else? What else about, what are you concerned about when you're at your work? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, what is my, is my professional reputation at risk? What kind of credibility do I have? Do I trust other people? How do I look in front of others? These all matter, and you need to be attuned to that uh, if you want to figure out where the organizational structures are and informal structures in particular, right? When you're talking about group norms, group norms that actually are not the explicit requirements within an organization, they're the implicit ones, the, the, and those you need to pay attention to. So when we start talking about security awareness, and then the first thing you do when you're doing your security awareness and you're measuring your awareness program or your training program or your monitoring program or any other program, and you find out later on that the manager and the supervisor don't really consider measurement important for whatever reason, then you've already hit a wall with that little group that could impact your entire organizational outcome. So it matters. Gap analysis. A variety of uh, sources of information for both these, both the current state and the desired state. The whole point is to man sort of manage the tensions and dilemmas and then the expectations of the organization a little bit here. Okay? Again, all those other people can help you come up with some of this. Very difficult for IT guys to go strolling into the finance sector of the organization and say, so, what concerns you? They're going to say, what do you want? What are you doing here? Go back in the basement, right? I used to be in the basement, by the way. We just had a little discussion. So <laughs> I used to live in the basement in an organization, so, we, so I understand and appreciate that a little bit. But uh, so if you drag some of those key stakeholders with you into the conversation, they're, much, they're going to be a conduit into those portions of the organization that matter to you. Finance matters to you, okay? HR matters to you in resolving your IT security problems because a lot of the issues pertain to the human dimensions with, of the organization, the human dimensions of security. So this gives you some uh, possible options to be looking at with respect to what you can be doing, okay? Um, Effective and economical, some are more effective and economical than others, <clears throat> and often you'll need to, you, because you're dealing with a complexity, you'll need to use multiple possible solutions, okay? We're not talking about the solutions yet, we're talking about possible solutions, okay? And look at all the, poss the options here. Organizational changes, personnel changes, incentive work redesign, learning training, policy changes, etc. And when you do your analysis, if you take systems thinking and you look at, okay, so I've got a developer who doesn't do any security uh, testing either before or during the development and then they wait till post-development testing, just before going to market. We already know, we heard yesterday that that's a problem. So if we want to set up a security development operations 
cell and they, and, or a secure development operation cell and we understand that they're doing it securely, we say, okay, well, we know they need some training. They'll need some training on security. Good. Done. We're done. We give them training. We're good. Well, maybe not, right? Maybe not. Maybe that's not the only thing. There's process changes that are going to have to happen. There's policy changes that are going to have to happen. You may have to do some work redesign within the team. I know I'm making this. There may be personnel changes you need to make. Right? These are a ripple effect from understanding what the outcome is you want within the, within the organization. When you're looking at your options and alternatives, then you need to figure out which one is your best option or which couple of options are, or, uh, options are best for you. Um, options analysis is pretty good. Lots of tools out there for this. Okay, and it depends on what your organizational culture is like, but ultimately the options analysis supports the decision making you want. You should be using balanced criteria, and we'll talk about that in a second. It needs to address the gap you've identified. Often we end up finding a solution that doesn't address the gap, but we implement that because it's easier, but then we don't solve the problem, do we? We want to help solve the problem. So when we're talking about criteria, it needs to be an open and honest discussion with whoever the decision makers are, whoever is helping you to develop the criteria as well. I think the first one up there, value focus, is, matters. Again, yesterday we heard about that, value. And that's where uh, the discussion with Tyler about the, what, what do you say, it was the, uh, what do you call it, the minimum viable uh, security. <clears throat> There were some hackles in the audience yesterday because of the minimum viable security. Well, no. As an organization, that's what you want. You don't want to be investing a lot of your energy in a space that you're not going to get any value for. And Paul, who was just here, talked about, he used his, here's how my, I don't know how many of you were in here. How many saw Paul's presentation? Yeah, you know, he showed the value of having an effective resiliency program, right? And he showed the resilience of the organization in his graph, okay? So those are the kind of things that matter. And they actually matter to us too. In IT, we, you know, in IT security, it matters. The value matters to us. Sometimes we have a difficult time expressing that up, but it matters to us, right? We don't want to waste money either. We want our money in the right places for the right thing. Technically sound, consistent, Small in number and high in quality, comprehensive, mutually exclusive. In other words, they should mat do the systems thinking. Think about the whole solution. Don't think about a part solution. Okay, there are certain organizations that are sort of notorious for uh, buying this, realizing that it may not work completely, and then later on having to go out and buy some other things because it comes out of a different budget in order to support this capability. Right? Be honest. Be open, say this is what we require in order to make this work, and this is the organizational changes or organizational requirements to make this work. Trade-offs, there's always going to be trade-offs. These need to be clearly articulated. And you need to be doing it with the developers, with the client and stakeholders in mind. <clears throat> this is important for that buy-in piece. Everybody understands buy-in. I'm not going to go into any great amount of detail, but if you want to be accessing resources you don't normally access, whether they be personnel or financial or logistical, you need to, you need to talk to those people. So, because they'll be able to tell you whether it's feasible, legal, appropriate to scale, et cetera. In generating your options, here's some, here's some things. Again, lots of tools on the internet for this, but if you, you're the one to do it, great. Take your time, learn about how to do it. Facilitate the, the, the group that you're working with to try to come up with a solution. But if you don't feel comfortable doing this, there's people in your organization, particularly the medium and large ones, that should have some capacity to be able to do this. Or they should be able to tap into a community that can do this for you. Smaller organizations, normally you're going to have to tap into the community somehow. <clears throat> but there's lots of people in this business, okay? I do, this is the kind of stuff I do for a living, so there's, not, there's lots of us around. It's just a matter of finding us. So once you've figured out what your options are and you've figured out you've got your sort of implementation plan in place and you know where you're going to go, 
So you've planned it, you've implemented. Here's where we talked about this uh, a bit yesterday, and again, Paul talked about this, about measuring. You need to be able to figure out if you're having the desired effect. You wanted a desired outcome, make sure you've measured it, and you can circle back and figure out if it hit, did, if it hit the mark. If it didn't, then you gotta go back and bring it back into the loop again. The one thing I would caution you on is when you're evaluating and you're measuring your outcomes and how those are affecting the security of the organization, if you're having even some of the desired effect, that's great. If you wanna go kick it back in to do more planning to improve, then the next baseline is where you're at. Don't take the previous baseline and say, well, we've proved 150% over the last six months because, right? No, the, base, the new baseline is where you're sitting from. That's why I like Paul's little demonstration there of his, of his resiliency model. Well, this is for this incident. And what does the next incident say? And then what does the next incident say? So trends are important as well. Right? So we actually have some time. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna do a couple of case studies just to see if you grasp the main points, and I'm sure you have, but I wanna, I wanna reinforce some of, the, some of the, uh, uh, the messaging here. So here's the case study. This is who you are, you're in medium-sized organization, client service, a lot of web presence. Um, pretty small IT shop, but it's pretty standard too, right? Here's your assumptions, you got a limited security culture, that's not unusual. Leadership focus is on client satisfaction because that's where the money is. And resource allocation is dedicated to services, okay? So we're mostly concerned in this organization about community and our ongoing web presence. Everybody got that? Here's the first issue, where's the money? Please take a read on that. I'll give you a couple of minutes to read it and then we'll chat about it. Get some ideas in your mind about some, some of the things, particularly looking at the main technical recommendations there and what else could be considered here from the human dimensions perspective. So what pops out at you for the first situation about the recommendation? Anybody? Yeah, very blanket, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it, almost certainly that will not solve the problem. Okay, that's a patch, if nothing else. There's, no, there's not a lot of systems thinking going on here in, 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 about addressing the issue. Anything else that comes to mind? Yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no organizational perspective on this. It's just one spe spe specific area. Anything else? So what kind of solutions, what other things should this, should, if you're the IT security advisor in this case, what other things should you be exploring? What other possibilities should you be exploring here to help them with this problem? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that, that is, that is, part of the problem here, right? So security awareness, what else? Well, there's a fundamental problem in there, isn't there? From an IT security perspective, a technical IT security perspective, there's a fundamental in problem in there in that they haven't got a clue of what sort of, what they're doing inside the system so we don't know what kind of monitoring or management we have of issues that have arrived in the organization. So 
what does this say about our architecture? What does this say about our monitoring? What does this say about our awareness? It's already been identified, right? What does it say about the resources that we have dedicated to this? <clears throat> you know? We've not, we've not been able to confirm the movement within the organization. Though. That's scary stuff, right? CFO, a lot of financial information on the organization. Some of it could be damning. We don't know, right? So in the context here, we know that this, is, this could be a, a big issue. Sensitive financial files. We don't know how bad it's been. We know the problem is that we've, we've, we've potentially got a, uh, an issue here with respect to the, uh, the uh, intrusion. And we don't know what's gone or what's missing, what kind of damage has been done. So <clears throat> we're doing some additional forensics. And we're focusing and targeting executive staff, like you said. So we're not looking at the larger systems picture. We don't know if we've actually got a valid risk assessment for this organization. We don't know if the right defensive mechanisms were put up in place to hide those sensitive files. I would suggest that if those are sensitive files, what were they doing in anything connected to the internet in the first place, right? There's lots of questions that need to be asked here, but it's, if you move back further, there's the security architecture matters, the people around the architecture matters, the monitoring organization matters, the forensics capability may matter, there's lots here that could matter. You need more data, I know, but there's lots here that could matter. You just need to appreciate that. It's more than just the incident itself. So, <clears throat> next one, constant clicker, same organization. These are both taken from real life examples, by the way. So, not that that matters. Almost everything is real life now. <clears throat> so, what immediately comes to mind based on what you've seen? What else? Yeah, absolutely. Where's the policies to support this? Yeah. Is this something that the organization promotes? Right? Anything else? Yeah, absolutely. So they're now restricting, restricting administrative privileges, but to who, when, where, why? Maybe. Maybe that account manager actually needs those administrative privileges for some reason. We don't know. We need to investigate that further. Anything else? Yeah, bang on. What was the, what, that, should, that should be a red flag on a problem, right? If our monitoring team hasn't picked it up and, they, and our response was delayed, what, what, what do we do? What's the, what does that say? We don't know, but we need to investigate it more, okay? And that will probably speak to resources or processes or reporting processes or communications within the organization. All these are people things, not technical things. They're all sort of workflow related or resource or capability related. So you're getting it. That's, what it, that's exactly the point. And I know you guys already knew this, but sometimes we just need to bring this to light again just to help sort of uncover some of the challenges we have in this space. And there are solutions, we just need to follow some, some, uh, some appropriate mechanisms to get us to the proper solutions. Mr. Einstein, oft-quoted fella. Go back to problem definition. What is the exact problem here? What are the issues around the problem that we need to address? Okay. So here are the key, 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 key messages. Okay. The humans are completely integrated into the IT world now. There's no doubt in our mind. Everybody is, everybody is uh, c cyber systems, IT systems, there's no doubt. In our discussion of IoT yesterday, 
it means it's just going to get, uh, I don't want to say worse, but it's just going to get worse before it gets better, if it gets better. Um, we got numerous challenges. We need to keep, the, keep in mind how we're going to address those challenges, but always consider the complexity, find ways around, around or find ways to solve the problem with the humans in mind at the outset as opposed to waiting until the incidence occurs. And ensure that we take, when we do design our interventions or, or select our options, that we have well-balanced criteria that actually has consideration from the organization as a whole. And again, these aren't onerous activities. The, the context analysis, gap analysis, and option analysis are not all that onerous. They might be onerous for a 125,000 person organization with a distributed economy. They're not a big problem for most of us here. So, are there any questions? No. This is just the uh, this is the uh, plug. <laughs>